Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is that you're tuning in, thank you for stopping by. This is the Martell Group Fireside Chats, where each week we sit down with an industry expert and get their unique perspective on the world through the lens that we all know as sales and marketing. On today's Fireside Chat, we're joined by Meredith Slemko, the Director of E-Commerce over at Kenview. Now, Meredith has a rich history in sales, marketing, insurance, and even a little bit of entrepreneurial flair thrown in on the side. Have a listen. I think about my own career in this space is um, being open to opportunities to learn. Having that natural curiosity and following it, don't be rushed to drive to the top. Take those those lateral moves to just grow your base and, and what I would refer to as the pyramid of your career. The, the stronger the foundation um, that you build, the more stable you are at the top. And so take your time and and learn and, and, and leverage that curiosity. Now in today's chat with Meredith, we dive into topics such as how to keep your ax sharpened, how social skills play a part in your sales cycle, and ultimately, how to stay hungry for new opportunities. Without further ado, let's hop right into it. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Martell Group Fireside Chat. It's great to have you all back here once again. I'm joined here today by a nice special guest, the Director of Commerce, E-Commerce, excuse me, for Kenview, uh, Miss Meredith Slemko. Uh, she is like I said, the director of e-commerce over at Kenview has, a, has a, a rich history both in the sales and the marketing world and even has a little bit of a entrepreneurial background too, I saw, right? Um, you know, kind of reading through some things on LinkedIn and whatnot. So excited to dive into this conversation. But first off, Meredith, welcome. So great to have Thank you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Happy to be here. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's let's go ahead and, and jump in. Before we get into some of the questions and learning about you, which I definitely want to take some time to do here, um, if you wouldn't mind, walk us through. Uh, like a little bit of background, who you are, who you represent. Tell us about Kenview. Give us just like a little bit of a background on who Meredith is. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. So I um, I have spent the last 12 years with Kenview, previously artist, previously known as Johnson & Johnson. And uh, <laughs> I have had a career across the commercial functions of sales, marketing, and now e-commerce. Um, prior to that, I actually worked in sales in an insurance company. Um, and so it set me up well for this sort of jump into consumer products, which is where I am now. Um, but my, my journey has mostly been in, in the commercial function, sales and marketing. Um, right now, I um, currently manage our end-to-end e-commerce business. So I manage our Amazon, uh, all our, our Omni customers, we refer to them as, as well as our last mile partners, uh, our partners like Instacart and Uber Eats and DoorDash, and our business with them in Canada. So I actually um, grew up in Canada. So I'm here uh, just outside of Toronto. And um, I uh, currently have two kids, six and three. And uh, so that that is my life. I'm sure you can imagine very busy, but uh, very exciting. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that that background. And I know um, you didn't touch on it too, too much, but I, I, I want to just highlight real quick, too. You own um, kind of like a coffee bar or smoothie bar, something like that in downtown Toronto. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So, you know, we like to flex other interests in our lives. Um, but it was a foray that um, I was sort of part of with my my husband. Mm -hmm. We uh, invested in an ice lounge in, in Toronto uh, called Chill Ice House. And uh, it was a family company and opened up a, a location in Toronto, which was amazing. You learn a lot. And then in the front, um, I personally opened up a, a coffee and smoothie bar. So it was actually during my mat leave. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a fun opportunity to test that entrepreneurial spirit. Gotcha. Kind of adding some, uh, some, some tools to the tool belt, right? You know, yeah, you, you exactly. have this background, you know, in, in sales and in marketing and you get a little entrepreneurial portion on the side. I'm sure that that just kind of helps sharpen the ax around the board, right? Absolutely. And I, all I really wanted to know is how to make a mean Americano. Ooh. So mostly did it just for that. <laughs> now, now I really want a cup of coffee. So I think I know what I'm doing as soon as we finish this recording. Yeah. Um, I love that. I, I'm kind of curious how you got started in, in all of this, right? Your sales and marketing, I, you know, are very intertwined in my opinion. I'm sure that they are uh, with, with you as well, but you mentioned kind of getting started in insurance and then kind of moving over to Kenview for the, for the previous 12 years. Where, where did all this begin with you, Meredith? When I was in insurance, I was um, direct to, to customer sales. So mm -hmm. 
the true the true sales where you're you're cold calling you're with the customer and and your objective in your job is to learn what the customer wants um, and fit um, fit your product uh, to their needs mm-hmm. um, what I really wanted to do was level it up to a more strategic selling um, career and so I actually went back to school uh, completed my MBA and through that secured a role with with Johnson and Johnson in a sales leadership development program so springboarding off of the direct to customer selling that I had had and really focusing on leveling that up to strategic selling. Um, And so through that two years in the rotational leadership program, I learned all the attributes of the many selling functions of a Mm -hmm. a, a CPG on the business to business side of of, of it. So it it really... um, it was it was an amazing pivot, and it just allowed me to elevate some of those skill sets. And through the time in sales, there's so many selling functions. There's mm-hmm. there's customer strategy, there's selling strategy, there's direct to customer, the account management side. There's a category solution selling. Um, there's shopper marketing. There's just there's so many careers within sales. And sometimes people say, "Oh, sales," and and you know get a bit scared, or they have a perception right. of what that means. And uh, you know, I love the idea of rewriting that um, and really creating some. Uh, a real understanding of what a, what a career in sales is like. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. And I'm sure taking like different as- aspects of this is is kind of what helps you not only shape, you know, the role that you're in, right? Because what you, you know, being the director of e-commerce, I'm sure that that requires you to have a lot of these multiple skills that you've learned over the years. But also, you know, you're you're able to kind of start building uh, your own kind of pathway in a way. Right. You know, you're able to kind of say, hey, I, I can I have the ability to do this and this and this. And here's what makes me unique. Right. Yeah. When you think about, I mean, the, the work that we do in building brands is, is really the the best way is having a full commercial lens on how we go to the market. So yeah. um, I, I might add in my career. So maybe I'll just go back a little bit. Started in the, the rotational program, learned the multi learned a few different attributes of sales then worked in traditional account management, worked with some of our big retailers in Canada. Then I actually moved over to marketing. So I did a marketing role, brand management for a bit. Um, And then I did customer strategy, which is sort of the merger between sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. And so from that end to end foundational understanding, it's all about our consumer and how we want to go to market with our brand. So whether you're selling or whether you're in brand management, it is all about building your brand's relevance in your consumer's mind. So from a brand perspective, you're building that mental availability. You want to be top of mind. From a selling perspective, you want to be physically available for consumers to buy. So the more traits and skill sets and understanding that you put yourself in across the full commercial end to end makes you stronger and in, in that that selling function or that traditional commercial function. Yeah. I'm totally curious. Do you have a side that you'd prefer or do, that you enjoy <laughs> more working on? I'm not trying to like pitch you against yourself or anything, but you've you've got a you know a sales start jumped over to marketing, kind of going back and forth and blending the two together, which which I love that. And I think that personally for me, I, th- I think that that's something everyone should experience at least once, um, yes. you know, learning both of those skill sets. But, you know, between working on the selling and go-to-market strategy and working on the brand strategy, do you have one that you prefer working on more than the other or at least enjoy a little bit more? Yes. I, you're not the first person to ask me that. Um, <laughs> it's, it, you know, they're, they're both so unique. I personally, I prefer the selling function. Um, I, I love the direct-to-consumer interaction. I love understanding my customers. Um <laughs> I love the ability to execute quickly. Um, brand is amazing. It is a longer term strategic build of your brand presence. But the best part about e-commerce where I'm in right now is it's, it's becoming more of a merger of those two functions because you're directly responsible for the sales that are selling on these platforms. Mm-hmm. But you are so integrated with the digital media for which you have to activate again. So it is it, the world is, is really putting these functions together in this space. And, mm-hmm. and I'm well positioned, but also I'm passionate about it as well. Passion is probably something, you know, it, like you just said, something that you have for this space and have for, for the function of your role and in, in your company and all that other sort of stuff. Um, passion is something that is, at least in, in my thought, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this too. Passion is something that, you know, you kind of get over time for whatever role that you're in, right? You don't just 
pick up something and say, I'm passionate about, like I'm passionate about this water bottle. That's not exactly how it works. So um, <laughs> how did you get to that point to be passionate about what you do? You've, you've gone through this journey and how, what what about e-commerce or about the customers or about the products? What, where's the passion behind everything that you're doing at the end of the day? I think there's probably three things that have driven it for me. Um, number one is, am I Am I working with products and brands that are truly making a difference in people's lives? Okay. And so I joined Johnson & Johnson. We own brands like Tylenol, Band-Aid, Polysporin, Nicorette, helping people quit smoking. Um, you know, truly brands that enhance the ability for everyday consumers to help their lives. Um, baby products, Tylenol pediatrics for, for children, mm-hmm. which I'm I have used a lot of, and I'm sure you will do the same. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, but you know, you you want to know that you're you're working behind a, a brand that really makes a difference in someone's life and and can and can save lives at home. Um, so that's number one, working with products you love. Number two is is the people. Um, CPG is such a fast paced, competitive but fun fun place to be in. From an industry perspective, you learn so much. Um, but it's the people. So if you work on great teams that support each other, um, I, I love the people I work with. They're brilliant. Um, they're they're strategic. They make everyone better together. So I think it's it's really about the people. Um, and so like the brands, the people, and and just um, the the ability to to make a difference. So when I'm at work, I feel the impact of my decisions, and I and it, you know really support my team to feel the same. So, you know, are you touching the business? Are you making an impact? Can you feel that? Can you see it? Like the ability to do that on a big organization is so um, inspiring. So I think those three things working together is, is what makes me passionate every day. I love, I love that answer because there's, there's a couple different things that you can, you can dissect from that. Right. And and the biggest thing that Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm interested in diving into is your team now. So mm. you have kind of translated right about your passion behind it and a couple different reasons why um, the people is is one thing in particular that you mentioned and kind of building a sales team and building a marketing team that's that's you know behind you or standing with you to kind of help drive your mission your goals whatever that is forward how would you recommend or, or what's your method for keeping that up when kind of like training and and continually educating your team? I love this question because I'm so passionate about Mm -hmm. people. And I think I've learned so much growing in my career as you start as an individual contributor in your space. You, You execute, you work hard, you grow with the organization. And then you hit this point of it's no longer about your contributions, but your people. And so your role is really about unlocking their capabilities and removing barriers for them to, to, to do what they, they are, you know, designed to do or what they can do or to realize their their true potential. So I think when I when I look at my team and what we look for in success is is I'm heavier, less like less on the technical side of selling and more on I look for sort of four things as we build a high performing team is especially in the e-com space, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest as well, but in this space is number one, um a curiosity. So mm. I love a team that is just a natural sense of curiosity. Because if you have the confidence to ask questions and be out there and just look to understand through that, you build so much more than you think. It's not just about what you're learning, but you're you're breaking down barriers and connecting with individuals and trying to understand where they're coming from. But you you, you know, you you dig in. Um, So I think that's really important for me. Number two is um, resiliency. So you're going to get a lot of no's and that is not just a sales thing. That is, that's an organizational thing and life is, and your job is to, to push, push the project and your ideas um, through um, and work through that. So resiliency is being able to get back up and continue to push forward. If you truly believe in your, your, you know, your projects, your work streams, your, your thoughts. Um, And number three is hunger. Um, You know, you can't be in sales without knowing that there is a target. Yeah. Um, but especially in the e-com space, we are, we are changing the trajectory of where we sell products, how we sell products, how we reach consumers. And, and there's a lot of capability building through that. And so there's going to be aspirational goals for which, you know, you want the team to be like excited and hungry for. Yeah. Um, and I'd say the last thing that really comes to me personally, but is just empathy and understanding that the people on your team are all working together. So 
it's not about me, it's about we. And how can you, how do I watch my team members put each other in each other's shoes um, or their cross functional partner's shoes um, to truly understand how to get the job done and where they're coming from? Because you're building, you're going to start building allyship across the organization and with your team if you can understand that empathetic part of, of, a, of a team. So, anyways, those four things, like those are most important to me and it, the attributes for building a high performing team and then the rest will come through technical knowledge and so yeah. forth. So I like that. I like that. And, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of different like technical skills and, and things like that, that, that I'm sure that your teams have to keep up with, especially in something yeah, that's yeah. as fast paced as, as what you guys do. Right. You, you've got those, those kind of like four pillars, let's call it right. You go those four yeah. pillars to your team and, and their development, just in their careers, their career advancement, like whatever they want to do with, with, you know, their, their careers and everything like that. On the technical side, though, what are what are the skills? What are the the maybe like daily, weekly, monthly type things that that you um, are are always asking your teams to kind of keep up with outside of like product knowledge and you know maybe like negotiation or or brand strategy? Like how how are you keeping your teams as as sharp as they need to be on top of their four pillars that they have on the on the sort of the technical side? I'd say um, industry knowledge expertise is is a key pillar to the Ken view way which is is always outside in so we build our strategies on what's happening with our consumer our customer so you know we constantly want to ensure that we're we're up to speed on what's happening with our customer both to understand them from a selling perspective but also as a company because it will direct how we go to market innovation planning um capabilities switch in strategic resources and so we really want to be as agile as possible and in, in bringing that information in. Um, on the other piece, um, you mentioned negotiation, but it's really about, we come back to the drawing board every month on like, what's your, what's your, what's your stakeholder mapping? How are you integrating yourself oh. with the customer? Okay. Um, who, you know, what individuals are there? How do we want to make sure we build relationships with them? Because on the selling side, you really want to foster that customer trust and that relationship because that's mm -hmm. what will accelerate both of us together through the joint business process. So we come back to the drawing board on like, how are you, how are your touch points? How are you working with your customer? Is there any support you need? Anything that any barriers removed so that you can really ensure that we foster that? Um, so I think that's a big piece in the selling space that, that that's top of mind. Um, and then outside of that, we obviously have formal processes within Kenview that help sure. support various development needs within the journey. Um, everything from from analytics training to negotiation training to um, you know own the room executive communication, um, or it could be just overall coaching on language skills or so on and so forth. And that's sort of a fundamental part. We you know we ensure that each individual completes that every year, mm -hmm. um, and it's shaped through what what needs that you really need yeah. uh, to sharpen for that following year. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure that that's very helpful too for your team because not everyone's needs are the same, right? So you're, you're exactly. kind of helping one person excel in A, but you know the next person is in F or G or you know whatever the the, the funnels that they need help in are, yes. you know, kind of what, where, wherever they're at, really. Absolutely, personal journey. Everyone has individual development goals, and uh, if you don't have, everyone has to have a development goal. <laughs> That's our priority as well. Is like no one, no one is perfect here. Like we're we're working mm -hmm. as a family, as a team, and and so kind of puts you on the spot just a little bit. If if you had to narrow it down to kind of like one skill, one technical skill that you think anybody in in sales or or marketing pick, I'll, I'll let you choose because you have both backgrounds, right? Do you have one particular skill that you think everyone should should sharpen their axe on, so to speak, every every month? Let's call it every every year. What what's the one thing you think people should drill down on? I'll say from a selling perspective, I would say strategic influencing. Okay, is and I I, I don't want to use the word negotiation, but it's internal and external. That it, it's the it's one of the biggest unlocks to ensure that you are successful in your role is how do you influence for disproportionate resources on your brands or your projects or your business and learning how to influence and self-reflection on your approach to pushing your projects through is such a crucial um, uh, capability yeah. for an individual in this space. So it's it's challenging. It's, it's a full, like it's a big part of my, our weekly 
calendars and just working through that. I think that's the skill set I would say. Like, I, I wouldn't say like it has to be Excel skills or anything technical. I mean, that is a must, but of course, um, you know, that I think that that's the piece that n- everyone is in like a c- continuous journey to perfect. I like how you phrased that. You called it social, I think you said social influencing, right? And, and how it, it's, it's not just negotiation, at least to me, right? The, the mm-hmm. way that I kind of heard that is that negotiation is a very finite set of things but when you add a social component to to how you're framing it 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 takes into account all of the maybe the misbalance of resources that you that you mentioned right or um any other external factors that um that that can kind of like either throw you off your game or help you or it's kind of like being very aware of of how you're going about your your relationship building in your conversations am am i understanding that correctly yeah yeah exactly and i Actually, I'm going to I'm going to merge our our words here because I said strategic influencing, but social is a big that's the input there, right? Is like you're you're getting feelers out there. You're you're empathetic. You're trying to understand both sides. You're because negotiation is really like, here's my position. Here's your position. And we're going to work and work to get to a middle ground, you know, that works for both of us with with some things that you may have to give up on long way. Mm-hmm. Whereas strategic influencing is like, I've got this goal and I'm going to learn and understand around those around me so that I can, you know, navigate to get to where I want to get to. Let's, you know, that's, that's a little bit about the, you know, your teams and skill sets and, and things of that nature. Um, I'm curious about you. What, what are some things that you're practicing in your role uh, that's helping you stay sharp, that's helping you stay on top of everything that, that you have going on here? Because I would imagine your, your, your plate, uh, you know, is, is pretty full with, with the position you're in. How, how are you staying on top of that? How are you staying organized with everything? Oh, if, I wish I had a very clear answer for that. <laughs> um, it's uh, like I said at the beginning, right? My skill sets have to change. Um, and the role that I play for the company and for the team is how do I bring outside in focus? Mm-hmm. Um, so I need to focus on building that external network in terms of connecting with the right individuals to to build e-commerce, not just for our company, but for Canada. So mm-hmm. we need to operate as a community and, and, and you need a point person in these companies to help rally for capabilities and resources because um, it's all based on the consumer. So I think for me in this role is really focusing on that external influencing and, and networking, I should say, and then bringing that back to the company to ensure that I, I challenge I create aspirational goals, um, and I really move Kenview along in a at a faster pace. Um, and so I think that's really where I need to differentiate myself and what I want to work on. Um, and you know, it's a type of selling, but totally completely different uh, w- within the space and the capabilities we need to bring. Kind of helps, you know, keep you on your toes. And I'm I'm sure that it's something where it's. You know, I, I like to use the example that you have a couple glasses in front of you, right? And it's impossible mm-hmm. to fill every single one, but you can balance how you probably go about your day, your week, your month, and, and everything in between, right? Just to make sure that you're still progressing forward. There's some sort of progress in everything that you're doing, but maybe it's, you know, hey, I need to pause this or, or curb this a little bit for a week, right? Be able to yeah. kind of manipulate it a little bit. You know, when you think about your day to day and in terms of priority is your team up front in the earlier in the week, make sure everyone has their priorities straight. And then, you know, there's always a bit of firefighting through your, your day or your of weeks. <laughs> so balancing that, um, but making sure you're ahead of the game to carve out thinking time in your calendar to be able to, to, to you know, to catch the next week early as fast as possible and, and you know, reprioritize. Um, I think that'll be a big piece. And there's so many facets to e-commerce um, yeah. or sales. Like in e-com, there's there's a, the customer piece and managing that relationship. There's capability building, like within our supply chain network. Um, there's there's content capability building, like content and digital media integration. And um, our new partners are popping up all the time that we want to make sure we foster those relationships sure. with. Uh, so there's there's different. Yeah, you kind of you jump around a little bit to. Um, on priorities. I, I want to dig into the e-commerce side of, of what you guys do, right? Because traditional selling typically involves like a, a relationship and, you know, hey, I've got something, I think you want it. You know, there's there's a lot of that going down the road, right? You add e-commerce on top of that, it it almost adds like another layer to the sales cycle, to the selling and, and everything like that. How are you getting from from the product to the sale? 
I guess is, is, yeah. is what I'm trying to ask here, navigating through extra layers that have to do with e-commerce. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. I mean, like maybe we chat for three hours on this because <laughs> there's there's so much to unpack. But right, um, yeah, you know, it, it's we're we're on a journey, right? Mm-hmm. COVID changed things for consumers, yes, um, and it opened up new doors. It, um, uh, you know, Canadian Canada is an interesting place where the investment in e-commerce hasn't been as accelerated as it okay. has in other markets, which is as a very it's a it's an interesting fact given how developed Canada is. Um, but what's interesting is COVID did force some of those investments. So it opened up new doors. Um, mm-hmm. However, we're still trying to build a talent and a skill set, to your point, in the selling framework on what does this mean? And then how do organizations organize themselves t- from a resourcing perspective to support that? And where does that where does that job sit? Does it sit with our traditional selling partners? So if you're an account manager, are you what's referred to as an omni manager? So are you responsible for selling product through our brick and mortar sales stores and our e-commerce sales? Uh, stores? Um, Or do we have specialized e-commerce account managers? Um, Because some of the capabilities and the things that influence that final purchase from the consumer are different levers and and they're new. And that is a lot to learn um, to do both. Um, And so organizations are still building themselves different. You talk to any top tier company and they're just, they're all structured slightly different on how they resource the retailers. Um, but it, it's 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 going to constantly change, and I think we yeah. have to be okay with that. Is like based on new capabilities being built that we just need to be able to react in an agile way and, and support that. But it's it's definitely a journey, um, yeah. and there's new new things that pop up all the time. I mean, we could again spend a whole other few hours talking about AI and the impact of AI is going to oh, make to the journey. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but in terms of just what it, what it takes to get a product to end consumers hands is, is, is changing constantly. It's more competitive, more levers that we need to touch on that journey. Um, so many influences. I, I, I use wild west loosely when I, when I talk about yes. e-commerce typically, right? Because I'm, I'm sure just like you said, there's a lot more levers. There's a lot more things that can happen in getting from a to B, but yeah. it's not like, there's anything that's, you know, whatever that journey is, there's probably no absolutely incorrect way to do it. There's probably so many different ways that, you know, to, to skin a cat, so, so the saying is, right? Where you can get, you know, the product in, in a consumer's hands. You can get a product to somebody in, you know, a handful of, of different ways. And, and I start mm-hmm. thinking about all the things that I'm influenced by from a social perspective, um, mm-hmm. and, and so kind of where I'm going with that is you, you've got your traditional e-commerce, let's call it, right? You go to a website or you go to an app or something like that. And apps probably aren't even traditional still at this point. There's probably still a lot of development that's going into into that portion of it. But I also mm-hmm. start thinking about things like, you know, ads and things like that that I get on like Facebook or Instagram or uh, the TikTok shop and all that sort of stuff. Are you guys playing in that social space at all? Or are you trying to stick mainly to your, your traditional e-commerce platforms and your websites and things like that? What's what's that looking like for you guys? If you're allowed to share, I don't want to give away yeah. too many secrets. The consumer path to purchase, we call it, it has okay. used to be very linear. And, uh, you know, from a, from a, from a, as I said before, man- mental availability of our brands and then physical availability of our brands, there was a clear journey and how we needed to to connect with the consumer along that space to convert them to, you know, wanting to buy or love our brands or products. Now that path to purchase is like (laughs) across so many elements, right? They're moving in a zigzag and there's, there's so many touch points that you can reach a consumer today. And so it, it, it becomes more complicated on how best um, to show up to the consumer along those touch points and, and in what efficient way Mm -hmm. that's going to truly make an impact and, layer on retail media networks that are coming out everywhere. Um, yep. Every customer is 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 investing in this space, every retailer. Um, that just adds more layers. And so um, it's 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 become, you know, it still is the traditional funnel of of moving a consumer, you know, from awareness to to seeing the product. Um, but it's changed so much. So so much. If somebody were to approach you looking for advice now to get an e-commerce platform started. And let's say it's not not a very big brand, but they've got something that they they kind of want to go after. 
what steps would you tell them to take to help them figure out what their journey is, whether it's a, a zigzag or something linear or something like that? How, how would you advise somebody else to kind of get that journey started? Well, it, you know, I think it really comes down to the consumer. So the consumer has to be in the center of everything you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so starting with your consumer is, is what is your what is the consumer looking for? How can you solve uh, maybe a gap in the marketplace with your offering? And then, you know, from there, how do you layer on reaching them in, in, a, in a way on where they are spending their time? So if your target market is in a certain space, um, where are those platforms for which they're consuming media or information? Um, and then from there, you can start to think through what is the assortment model of, that you want to bring on to e-commerce? Because that's what really differentiates itself from in-store is it, it should be a unique assortment, different assortment mm-hmm. um, with a different model. The, the, the more complicated like sort of layer on the halo is now how are you going to reach the get the product to the end consumer in the most efficient and profitable way possible? Mm-hmm. Um, because at the end of the day, that the last mile of getting that product to your consumer is the space that is is still, um, you know, scaling. Um, right. And Amazon is fastly approaching, you know, creating some scale in that space. But that is one of the most challenging pieces. And so building out the profitability model will only support that cyclical e-commerce um, growth. Um, but that really is important to reach the end consumer is, is, is in a profitable way. Do you have any particular strategies that you guys are, are implementing at Kenview, if you don't mind sharing, um, that, that you found to be particularly effective in how this stuff is scaling over the past you know X number of years? Is, is there anything in particular where you're like, this is where we started and this is how we got to the next milestone or goal or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, without providing any proprietary strategic information, I understand. (laughs) um, Yeah. I think we're just, we're, we're looking at ways at being innovative with um, our partnerships with customers um, and doing as many tests and learns as possible. Um, I think that's really important. I think that's shareable is, um, you have to do a ton of tests and learns in e-commerce before you scale. So what's working? And we've tried, we're trying a little bit of everything across supply chain to media, to assortment models, to promotional models. We're, we're sort of touching everything within the space mm-hmm. to understand um, what's going to move the needle with our consumer. Yeah. Um, and it's such a, it's at more of a micro level, um, which is also a new way of thinking in this space is traditionally you run a big you know, execution in the brick and mortar space and it's big, it, there's a return on it. There's, it makes a lot of sense in e-commerce. Mm-hmm. It's small, it's, uh, it's iterative. So I think that strategically is how we need to approach it and where yeah. we're seeing those small successes and then scaling small successes and scaling. I love that. Now yeah. at, at, at risk for not running this and turning this into a three hour conversation, cause I, <laughs> I would love to dig into this so much more. Cause I, yeah. I, I find a lot of this fascinating cause I have a slight background in, in e-commerce and getting things off the ground in, in kind of like yeah. a digital age, right? Um, much smaller scale than what Kenview is doing, but I'm interested, are there any, particular technologies or, te- you know, particular advancements that are just involved in the e-commerce space in general that have you the most excited about the future of e-commerce? I, I know you touched on like AI a little bit. Is is that the answer? Is there something else on the horizon that, you know, kind of everybody's looking forward to? I think an area that's going to make everyone's, going to say everyone's, um, <laughs> I think allowing allowing us to focus on the strategic element of e-commerce is um, automation and okay. automation of some of the small work that we do um, to free up time to grow the top line, right? So mm-hmm. things like, if I could use examples, um, content development. Um, so we have so many outlets to release content to. And we've got great content, but it has to be resized. It needs to be created. It needs to be customized. It needs to be, um, and that is, that's a lot of work. And we want to, we want to show this great content, but it's the requirements across the space and the different media outlets that we work with are just so different. Um, Automation of, you know, scraping data to be able to put it into dashboards to make quicker decisions um, on pricing or out of stocks or inventory or, um, 
you know, any of that or even consumer listening and trying to understand what's happening with their consumers. There's just, there's a few facets of automation that actually really excite me because I think a lot of our time is spent. It's like, you know, a lot of manual work versus the the strategic work of growing the business, building yeah. the customer relationships, things like that, that I, I think we're all still building capabilities behind. So I think I would say that excites me. The, the content side of what you just said, like hits home with me so hard, just yeah. like on the side, doing my own sort of content or, or, or developing content in the way that it needs to be done is insane how many formats you have to have, right? Because you think about, so many. you think about like Facebook ads are in like a four or five mm-hmm. aspect ratio. You've got phones, everyone scrolls content on phones nowadays that is yeah. in, you know, like a 16 by nine. It's just it's it's yep. crazy when when you start really peeling back the onion layer of what needs to be done. There are a lot of complexities to it, and and just what you said, the automation behind that, I'm sure would make you guys and, and anyone who needs that type of automation, like your your workflow just becomes so much shorter, so much quicker, and more efficient at the end of the day. And and you want to be fresh. You want mm-hmm. with things moving so fast. It's not even just even the specs, but the um, the relevancy. Uh, to to That's something that happens in the marketplace. So you know, if 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 something's trending and your product or your your brand is super relevant for that, how quickly can we turn around content to ensure that we're talking about that and how we're reaching out to consumers? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it can happen so so fast. Or did Taylor Swift say that thing about our product that we can oh, no. integrate <laughs> into our content really quickly? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do we? Yeah, how do we sneak this video clip in in here and make you know make everything just kind of blow up? Man, that's just, yeah, yeah. I, with I, all I, trademarks in place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, oh man, that that's just that gets yeah. me excited just hearing your excitement behind it. Right, I can tell <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of excitement behind your voice and, and maybe because it's Taylor Swift or not, but you know, I, I think there's a lot of excitement behind that because it, it's one of those things where you walk in each day, not knowing full well what will happen, right? You can't just yes. map out your day knowing exactly what will happen, but you know that you've got the passionate people that you work with, the, the passion that you have for what you do. It all just kind of streamlines up into this exciting challenge of like, okay, here's where we are. Here's where we want to go. How are we going to get there? And, yes. and how do we make it as seamless and as efficient as possible? And I think that that's, you know, just for me, it, that any sort of project that I have that has those elements behind it, I'm like, I, I, nothing's off the table at this point. Let's just make it happen. Yeah. Let's just, yeah. Let's just you know, roll up our sleeves and, and let's get to work here. Hunger and yes. resiliency and yeah. Boom. All, yeah. all the all the things that you talked about at the beginning. This is like, <laughs> we've come full circle. <laughs> full circle. I love it. Uh, it's, it's so awesome. Um, well, I know we're, we're kind of coming up on time here. Uh, and, and, and I really appreciate everything that you've shared with us already. I, I know that, um, you know, I can tell, like I said, that there's a lot of passion that what you have um, behind that. And, and, and I love hearing that from you and, and just hearing about the excitement of, of what you're working on day to day. Maybe not the particulars, right? To make sure we're not, uh, we're not giving away any trade secrets. And I'll make sure you keep those to yourself. But um, you're just hearing that passion, I think is exciting. And, and I, I think that that's translating really well to everyone, you know, who happens to be listening out there. Um, as we wind down though, you know, I want to kind of give you the floor if you don't mind. Um, and you know, any sort of like ending advice, last minute advice, things that you would kind of, you know, give out to the readers, uh, you know, who may be listening in, you know, what, what, what's something that you'd want to tell them or, or, you know, kind of like, industry knowledge you'd want to put out there for anyone who's looking to either get into this space or who is in this space already and is trying to work on developing their own funnel further. Being a bit more agnostic from from some of the the specifics in this space and more around your maybe your career um, and, and just where you are and what you're trying to develop is, is if I think about my own career in this space is um, being open to opportunities to learn constantly um, has okay. allowed me the opportunity to get into this space that I am passionate about because I just followed my curiosity and my hunger to learn. And and I don't know if anyone's done those strengths finders, but learner is one of my strengths and and mm. something that I I that that drives me. And it's allowed me to build the skill set and to to lead it amazing team that's that's passionate about making a difference in this space and, and building capabilities so i think just having that natural curiosity and following it don't be rushed to drive to the top take those those um you know lateral moves to just grow your base and and 
what I would refer to as the pyramid of your career. The, ah, the stronger yeah. the foundation um, mm -hmm. that you build, the more stable you are at the top. And so take your time and and learn and 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 leverage that curiosity. That's awesome. I think that's a that's a perfect way to kind of like cap off the the entire conversation. And, and like I said, I would love to dig into this, you know, even a little bit more. So you know, I, I, if you're open to it, we may have to talk about a little reunion tour between you and I because I would love to kind of continue this conversation maybe in a couple of months and uh, kind of see not only maybe what's changed and what's new about what you guys are working on at Kenview, but, you know, maybe dig into some more specifics around how technology is advancing just in three short months. Cause I'm sure that it will, right. Yes. Uh, that stuff takes off uh, like, like a rocket. So, but for the sake of time, we'll, we'll kind of end it off here. Meredith, thank you so awesome. much for, for being a part of this conversation. I loved everything that you, you said. And, and like I said before, I can tell that there's a lot of passion behind what you do and, and everything that you do and whatnot, all the pillars that you mentioned, not only for yourself, but also your team and, and skill sets and things like that. So um, I really, really appreciate the conversation. Uh, we'll have to look at another one here in, in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris, for the opportunity to take the soapbox and talk about e-com and the company and careers. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank awesome. you. Shout out once again to Meredith for spending some time with us for this fireside chat. I could tell that throughout our conversation, Meredith is incredibly dedicated to her work, not only in her role, but for the people that surround her. And I hope you got a small taste of that as well. If you have a favorite part that you enjoyed, feel free to leave a comment down below and let us know your thoughts on this chat with Meredith. Be sure to like the video, consider hitting that subscribe button and turn on the notifications so you can be alerted when future chats go live on our channel. Thanks for listening and as always, happy hunting.